Uh, it, it's my very, very great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Zed Mason. Dr. Mason has had an impressive career serving the CSU as an educator and researcher and in campus leadership roles. Until recently, Dr. Mason has served as the interim assistant vice chancellor for research initiatives and partnerships at the CSU office of the chancellor. He has served as the associate vice president for research and sponsored programs, as associate dean for research in the College of Natural Sciences and Mathematics at CSU. U Long Beach. He was the founding director of the Institute for Integrated Research in Materials, Environments, and Society, which is an environmental laboratory accreditation program, certified core facility for elemental, isotopic, and molecular characterization. And Dr. Mason was also the co-founder of the WM Keck Center for Education in Proteomics, which provides hands-on training for research and education in proteomic analysis. Dr. Mason's academic journey has spanned continents. He received joint honors baccalaureate degrees in marine zoology and oceanography and his PhD from the University of Wales. And he completed a Natural Environmental Research Council postdoctorate at the University of Reading, followed by a Medical Research Council postdoctorate at the University of Sussex. In 1989, he joined the Department of Biological Sciences at CSU Long Beach after a brief faculty appointment in the Department of Bioengineering at University College London. And as a faculty member, Dr. Mason was funded continuously by NIH and NSF, as well as a number of other funding sources for his research in applied ecotoxicology. Dr. Mason has been on the editorial panel of two journals, has published a number of invited book chapters, and also over 60 peer-reviewed articles in scientific journals. And we are so delighted that Dr. Mason is here to speak to us about his experiences in bringing together teaching and scholarship. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is this mic working? Can you hear me? All right. Well, thank you much for that. Uh, Amazing introduction. It really doesn't sound like me at all. I mean, it's, uh, um, it's been a really interesting journey. I, I've been in the CSU for 31 years. And uh, when I came over from the UK, I have to tell you that my plan was to stay in the US for two years. And I was off to Australia. And uh, my girlfriend then, now my wife, accompanied me. And that was, uh, that was our career plan. And 31 years later, you know, I leave the CSU. And I have to say that I wouldn't have changed that career for any other career that I can possibly think of. I mean, for me, it was the perfect blend of scholarship and teaching. And that's a, a rare sort of commodity within a university system. One of the things that I've really tried to do over the 31 years is, is elevate the importance of research um, on my own campus, first actually in my own department, then in the college, then in the university, and then finally actually at the level of the system in the chancellor's office. And for those of you who know me, I actually retired about a year and a half ago uh, from Long Beach as the uh, AVP uh, for research. And, and I was asked to come back from the chancellor's office out of retirement to take on the vice chancellorship, assistant vice chancellor for research initiatives. And I fulfilled all of the criteria. I was local, I was available, and I was cheap. <laughs> <coughs> but it was a really hard conversation that I had with my wife because we'd been planning to retire together. She'd retired actually three years before me. And, you know, I, I said to her, I said, you know, sometimes you have to set aside what you want to do for what you want to achieve. And I said, I have no idea what this year will bring, but this is really one opportunity for me to go to corporate HQ and talk about the importance of research in the CSU. And I understand the California master plan, but I can tell you as an educator and someone who's worked on at least a couple of continents, you know, I've never been able to reconcile the fact that you know, those in the legislature and other people, and in fact, there was just a, a write-up in the LA Times which has said that the CSU faculty should not do research. That should not be part of our mandate. We are here exclusively to teach, and that's what we should be doing. We should all be teaching 12 WTU, and our service to the state 
is to graduate students in four years. And I have problems with that. Okay? I always have. Because for me, a university really is about higher education. And it's the discovery of new things, of truth, of enlightenment. And when I use the term research, I mean, I'm going to use that as a generic term for all forms of scholarly activity. And it doesn't matter what discipline you're in, whether you're in music, whether you're in art, whether you're in performance, whether you're in engineering, science, the humanities, in literature. Okay? It's that scholarly contribution that I think is bestowed upon you as individuals to carry forward. You are the custodians, really, to bring that forward. There is no other institution that is really entitled to do it. And that's because we are charged with this because we are not biased. So if you look amongst the big institutions, who else could look for truth? Would it be the federal government? Does that seem reasonable? They change periodically. Would it be Wall Street? I don't think so. I mean, they have an investment, okay, but it's monetarily driven. Should it be the church? No, in fact, there is no other institution, really, that can bring this forward. And, and in fact, I would argue that you know, three of the characteristics that have been given to universities are really important with regards to this endeavor, and they outline the importance of it. And that's academic freedom. That's critically important. Tenure and the sabbatical. There is no other institution that has those three. And they're not given to you so you can teach continuously from the textbook and just convey information. What they're asking you to do is they're asking you to convey knowledge. And knowledge comes from the discipline and from what you have learned through a practitioner and as a contributor to the discipline. And let me tell you, as a knowledgeable professor, you can convey a lot more to your students and inspire them to a greater degree than if you're just simply an instructor. So for me, it's been very hard to reconcile some of the things that have been said that we should not be scholars. Because I honestly believe that that is a key tenant with regards to, s to faculty success. And if you don't have faculty success, I don't believe you can have student success. And in fact, it comes before student success. And there needs to be an investment made in the faculty with this regard. So that conversation that I had with my wife was a difficult one, because she really was hoping that I would come out of retirement. And I have to tell you that when I took the position, I didn't meet the chancellor. I never had an opportunity to interview him at all. I was taking a chance, and I told my wife, I said, you know what, I have no idea what this year will bring. None at all. It might be a total waste of time. And in fact, I think I was about three weeks into the job when I first met the chancellor. And we got in the elevator, and Academic of Student Affairs is on the sixth floor of the chancellor's office. And he stepped in, and I stepped in. There was one other person who got out on the first floor. So I had him for five floors. <laughs> <coughs> and I stepped up to him and I said, Chancellor White, you don't know me. My name's Zed Mason, and I'm your new interim assistant vice chancellor for research. And I just need you to know that I've come out of retirement to have a word with you. <laughs> And I could see the whites of his eyes, okay? <laughs> and the bubbles, you know, it's like, where is security when you need them? <laughs> but I knew enough about the Chancellor, I'd met him once, that I think he could, I felt that I could communicate with him with regards to some of the things that I had been experiencing locally on my campus with regards to faculty frustration and the fact that scholarship was not well regarded or invested in. And I felt that he needed to know that, okay? And I was ready for retirement, 
He could have fired me right there and then. Okay? He didn't, actually. Um, but when we left, much to my surprise in my Outlook calendar, there came, popped up, um, basically a one-hour meeting with him. And I came home to my wife that evening, and I said, you know, I've been in the CSU system for 31 years. Today was the most meaningful day in my life because the chancellor gets it, okay? And I don't know, I notice this is being televised here, so I, I don't know where this will be communicated, but <laughs> hopefully not to the chancellor because I don't want to put him on the spot. But, but I strongly believe that. And you now have a new executive vice chancellor, Lauren Blanchard, who I worked with over the last six months, and he really understands the importance of scholarship as well. And that you can't actually extricate scholarship out of the institution. You can't do that, okay? You actually, you actually diminish the product as a result if you were to do that. So, I mean, I'm very passionate about research and the role it plays, and it comes largely from a personal perspective. And, and you know, I, I was struggling in terms of what to convey with regards to this talk. I, ha I had no idea what the expectations were. My understanding is that the gong will go in half an hour, okay, and that will give you half an hour for, for questions. But I thought rather than talk about the politics or the, the sort of the administration, I'd talk about a personal story, okay? And it's, I don't think it's a unique story, and I, I, in fact, if I look around the room, I think all of you have probably a similar story to tell. A personal story how research changed your life, and as a scholar, as you convey research to your students, how it's changed their lives as well. So, so really the talk is why research matters. So I'm an immigrant, first generation, non-English speaking. <laughs> no, seriously. I'm a Hungarian refugee, came over in 58, my parents couldn't speak English and still couldn't really when they died. Okay. I wasn't that good in school. Okay. I suffered in English. I mean, there was deficiencies there. I was good in math, but that was pretty much it. Struggled through school. Just managed, after my, you're, ex, you're examined at 11 and at 16 and then at 18, there are three examination points just managed to scrape through all three of those. And uh, it's interesting, when you apply to university in Britain, you, they basically make you an offer. You select whatever universities you want to do, go to, and what subjects, and you're locked in right from the start. And they give you an offer. They say, if you meet these sorts of, sort of examination uh, criteria, we will admit you. And one of the things that you have to have to get into a British university is a foreign language. Now, English was foreign to me, so I felt, <laughs> I felt that seemed reasonable. Um, they didn't buy that. And in fact, I failed French the first time, and then when I took the retake, I failed it even worse. Okay. So really, there was no possibility for me to go to university. And it was really peculiar because after they've taken everyone that they want to, they're left with the riffraff. And they just interview a few people who didn't make the criteria. And I was one of those, and I remember it very distinctly. This was a defining moment in my life. I was granted an interview, and depending upon the success of that interview, I would either go to university or I would not. And I walked into the room, and there were about seven professors there, all looking at their notes. And we sat down, and the question was, and it was predictable, it was like, Mason, you need a foreign language to get into a university. And we noticed that you failed miserably twice. What do you have to say for yourself? And, you know, at 18 years old, um, you sometimes say the first things that come to your mind. <laughs> and it went something like, well, if my lectures 
or in French, then I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point in time, I was thinking, if, if only I could bring that back, okay, because I, that really wasn't what I wanted to convey, but that's what I felt. And I walked out of that interview thinking that there was no possibility. And it was pretty amazing. I got in. I have no idea why, okay, but they let me in. My sciences were pretty strong, but French and English, not so strong. So I went to university, and uh, I was actually really successful. Guess what? They didn't lecture in French. And, <laughs> and that was key for me, because it was just mathematics and science, and we'd had none of this GE that you have here. I was down to things that I could understand that were logical. And I'd, I was very, very successful at university, but to be perfectly honest, I was pretty bored. I succeeded in all of the exams. I came top in the class. Okay, I'm bragging a little bit here. But, but I really wasn't challenged. To me, it was an extension of school, and I had no idea where my career trajectory was taking me. And um, it was in my final year that I, I made the decision that I was going to become a garage mechanic. Um, I would got my way through college, basically fixing cars in the parking lot. Uh, my father was a garage mechanic when he came over. That was one thing he knew. Um, and he taught me basically car mechanics. And uh, that seemed to be where I was going. Um, and because of my grades, I was offered an opportunity to basically do what they call an honors program. And that entitled you to do research in your final year. And for me, that was a pivotal and defining experience in my life. I can't describe it in any other way. Okay, I, my, my, my project was to isolate a hormone from the brain, to label it, and then do electron microscopy and find out where the targets were at the cellular level. And they taught me electron microscopy. And there I was one day, alone at night, in the lab. It was about 10 o'clock. And I was looking inside these cells at magnification of about 50,000. And I was looking to see where these hormones were attaching to cells. And I thought, my god, this is fun. <laughs> I want to do this for the rest of my life. And from that moment to this, I've never worked a day in my life. It's just been fun. So that experience I don't think is unique. Okay, and, and I would say that that is a way that you can capture students' imaginations, and that's a way that you can make a difference, because it conveys relevance to the subject, it engages them in a way where they're discovering for themselves, it allows for peer interaction with the research group, and the results can be astounding. They can be really astounding. So what I'm going to do, and I'm probably going to now I know so I've only got 20 minutes left. I'm probably going to skip through a number of things or go through them fairly rapidly. But, but what I'd like to do is talk about some of the things that are, I did at Long Beach. I don't think they're particularly ex exemplars of anything. I mean, they're just some of my experiences. And you probably have the same and probably with similar results. As I say, I, I think I'm just communicating something you probably already know. OK. so. I'm going to show you first some statistics with regards to graduation rates, six-year graduation <laughs> rates in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. OK, because that's the discipline that I'm from and I'm familiar with. And what you'll see here is basically a graph where you're looking at six-year graduation rate against combined SAT score. And I've taken it for six years, and I've plotted about eight of the CSUs on this graph. And what you have up here is SLO. And what you can see is that there's essentially a linear trend. Okay, San Francisco State isn't on this, but it falls on that line. And what this is telling you is that the higher your SAT, the greater your chances of graduating in a STEM discipline in six years. And that's not astounding. You say, well, they're better prepared. Obviously, they're going to graduate with a higher degree of success. One of the things you'll notice is that within a particular university, they're grouped very, very tightly. So 
So SLO for those six years, it's up here, grouped very tightly. I don't know which one this one is. Is this Fullerton or San Jose? Grouped very tightly. And in fact, you can take all 23 campuses and you can plot them out, and this is what they look like. I can't tell you which one San Francisco State is, but it's on that line somewhere. And it's got a pretty high R squared value. So it tells you that higher SAT score, the higher graduation. Not unexpected. However, this, oh, unfortunately, some of the, the graphics didn't come out. This is the average SAT score for Caucasian students, freshman students. It's around about, I don't know, 1050. This is it for Hispanics. And this is for African Americans. So what we're really looking at is diversity in the campuses. The higher your proportion of minority students, the lower your SAT score. So consequently, when you plot the thing out, what it shows you is that you end up with essentially a reciprocal relationship, but the lower your minority enrollment, the higher your graduation rate. Let me make a really important point here. This has got nothing to do with aptitude. Absolutely nothing to do with aptitude. It's about wealth and opportunity. The richer you are, you can afford to buy houses in the best school districts. And let me tell you, I'm part of that problem. My kids go to a good school because I can afford to buy a house within that school district. I can afford to get them a tutor. So what you're looking at is disparities in wealth which give rise to disparities in outcome that map to ethno-demographics. And this represents a social injustice because in my mind, okay, education is for all. So, it's pretty evident what's going on. And again, this is in the STEM disciplines. When you look at the attrition rate, this is our African Americans, this is our Hispanics, Asians, and our Caucasian students. We see attrition occurring very, very rapidly at different rates within the first three years. And that's where we have the retention problems, the first three years. And you can probably take this, and I don't think it would be very much different for any of the other disciplines. Okay, you can take, this data is available on the Chancellor's Office website, and you can plot it out to find out what it looks like in your particular department. So the question is, how can we improve retention here in this phase? And this is where I think research has a really important role to play in terms of engaging students. Okay, the critical things is, is how you're going to implement it, how it's going to be scalable, and how you're going to afford it. Okay, and those are some of the critical elements that need to be reconciled to make this formula work. So we're hearing a lot about student success. And as a CSU system, we've invested heavily with regards to student success. But these are the statistics with regards to graduation since 2004 and 2008 cohort, so it's a six-year cohort, so this represents graduating in 2014, and you will see that those lines have not moved. We have not done anything. Now, it looks as though this last year, and I don't have the numbers because they haven't been reported yet, we have shown a slight improvement, but essentially, this is flat for all of our demographics. We have not made a difference in STEM. So the question is, what can we do that's different that will change these numbers? When you look at enrollment in STEM across the CSU, we've doubled our enrollment in STEM in the last 10 years. And it's entirely due to one demographic, and it's Hispanics. So these are the Hispanics here, and we've had basically a double a doubling in our enrollment. We now have, across the system, 
100,000 students declared in STEM. That's phenomenal. And it represents an opportunity, an opportunity for the system to make a difference, not just in California, but at the national level. And the Department of Education, National Science Foundation, the NIH, a number of these bodies are really interested to know what the CSU is going to be doing to improve Hispanic student success. And it's critical, and it's political as well. So this is J January the 11th, boosting Hispanic share of STEM workforce, crucial for economic growth. Because when you look at the economic engine that drives not just the state, but the country, most of the revenue comes from the STEM disciplines, and it's from intellectual property, and it's its development and commercialization. That is basically the root funding for the US. And to have this growing demographic, but not have them graduate or represented in the STEM field, represents a recipe for disaster. Disparities in STEM employment, sex, race, and Hispanic origins. More Latinos with STEM dis discipline, STEM degrees needed, here are top schools doing it. And in fact, a report from the White House basically said, given that less than 2% of the STEM workforce is Hispanic, whereas 20% of the young demographic is Hispanic, represents a major, major problem, an economic problem for the nation. And in fact, those statistics have got worse. The irony is that it's getting even worse. And that's because the financial or the wealth divide is becoming more and more prominent. The rich are becoming richer, the poorer are becoming poorer, and we're finding the disparities are growing between the classes across the country. So I gave a, a talk at NASA, and I talked about this problem. And one of the NASA administrators put, put his hand up and said, so, Dr. Mason, you know, what's the solution? And I said, it's really, really, really simple. You take your best teachers and you put them in the worst schools. That's what you need to do. You need to invest in education. This problem disappears. Now, that's a quite a trite answer. But I want you to remember that message because I'll come back and circle round to that in a second. Okay, so how do you engage students in research? Well, one of the easiest ways is to incorporate it in your classes. And I understand it, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do, and it's probably a little bit easier maybe in the sciences than in other areas. I don't know. I only can speak for the sciences because that's my own personal discipline. But I think community-based participatory research is a way to really get students involved. For Long Beach, Cal State Long Beach, where I was, you know, many of the students were commuter students. Okay, they come from the local community. They're engaged in it automatically. And if there is a research problem in your local community that you can help solve and have students engaged in, then that becomes a very, very meaningful experience that students can relate to, and they can convey to their parents with regards to significance. It combines the theory with the practice, the tangible results, and the relevance issue. So I was approached by uh, a group called the Friends of the Colorado Lagoon. And they were having problems with what were perceived as environmental issues in a lagoon which was located pretty close to campus. And here's the lagoon. Here it is here. And, and if I was to find you know, Cal State Long Beach, it would be around about here. It's about a mile away. And they approached me. I was teaching aquatic toxicology at the 400 and 500 level. And they said, we believe we have a pollution problem. Is there any way that you can come do an assessment? And I said, you know what? I'm going to have my class come and do an assessment. Okay, and get them involved, because I, I think it's something that would be of real relevance to the course. So a little bit of history about the Colorado Lagoon. So this is back in 1921. It was part, basically, of a, an estuary system. So this is a marshland which drained out into the sea, and this is the proximity of the lagoon. 
And as you can see, it's part of this wetlands here. And then around about 1926, when they held the Olympics in LA, they developed the lagoon into this structure here, which is where they held the rowing. So this is where they held the rowing for the Olympics. And here's the lagoon area here, but you can see that it communicates still with the sea, so you have tidal flushing. There's good circulation there. And in fact, it was uh, used, and here is the, the diving event that they had for the Olympics in the lagoon, and it was used recreationally. And then what happened was, around about the 60s, um, they put a road across there. So now what you had was the lagoon isolated from the marine stadium, which communicated with the sea. And they decided to put in a, a very, very small culvert. It's about four feet in diameter. So now we had problems with tidal flushing of the lagoon. And the other problem was, if this is sort of southeast Long Beach, the lagoon, which is here in yellow, was actually also the storm drainage site for all of these watersheds. So we have episodic rain, and we have a flushing event, and everything ends up in the lagoon, which doesn't communicate that well with the ocean. So here's a typical flooding event, and these are the storm sewers which come from these different sort of watersheds. And the end result is this is what it looks like after a storm event. And that's the stuff you can see. All right, it's not the stuff that you can't see. So the idea was I was going to take my class out there and have them do an environmental assessment and risk impact based upon this course. And the idea was that we would teach them some of the fundamentals with regards to you know, the origins of these materials, the, the way that they were bioaccumulated, their molecular points of impact in the cell, the eventual outcomes with regards to toxicity. And then we would go out and we would sample it, find out what was there, and then relate that to the literature and say, how harmful is that to the environment? So, the students had to get down and dirty, okay, literally. So we had to collect mud samples and some of the infauna, some of the invertebrates that were in the mud. And then, as part of the class, what I did was I took EPA-approved standard operating procedures with regards to the analysis of metals and organics. So I, I took their quality assurance and quality control basics explained it to the class, and we followed through on all of these things. We had the appropriate blanks, spikes, we did recovery, we used stable isotopes to, to look for different types of retention issues, and for those of you who are chemists, you know, we did methods of standard additions, I can go on ad nauseum, but we had all of the quality control in there because what I was trying to convey was that aquatic toxicology, you know, you had to be accurate and precise with your numbers, okay? Because what you're gonna do is you're gonna report a risk assessment based upon your analyses, and understanding all of these different nuances were critically important. So we then generated the numbers. We did inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, which is a mouthful, but we did the metals with that, and then we did gas chromatography, mass spectroscopy for the organics. And the students learned all about it, and they followed through, they did all of the QAQC, and it passed, it passed all the QAQC. And what you can see is that in certain sites, these sites here, eight and nine, and one over here, we have elevated levels of, in this case, it's polyaromatic hydrocarbons. But we looked at an entire suite of all of the EPA, sort of what we call high crime chemicals. So we looked at DDT, looked at, uh, um, a number of other chemicals as well as metals. And we published this not in the peer literature, but actually on a website. So it was part of the course website. And the students learned a lot. And then the next thing I know, I get a phone call from the EPA, and they said, we have come across your data set, and we would like to use it in court. And I said, woo. Hold on a second here. <laughs> this was a class project. And they said, 
but you followed EPA procedures. And I said, well, yes, yeah, when it was a class project, but we followed EPA procedures. And it passed the QAQC. And I said, yes, it passed the QAQC. And they said, therefore, we'd like to use it. So they used this data in court, and they were with the Friends of the Colorado Lagoon, and it was against the local water, water uh, uh, district and the Regional Water Quality Control Board. And I, and I don't know, you know all of the ins and outs of it, but ultimately it resulted in this data being used to basically support the argument that there needed to be a remediation effort in the lagoon. And here it is. It was like a $10 million project. And the city was held accountable for cleaning up the site. The students got a real kick out of this, I'll <laughs> tell you. <laughs> because now they can see the relevance between what I was teaching them in class about the toxicology and the molecular mechanisms, but a real outcome. And this was changing their own environment, their own backyard. Okay, and this remediation will be complete fairly soon. And this sediment is so toxic around those outfalls that they've had problems in terms of di its disposal. They've had to bury it. Okay. So that's one example of how you can engage students in some meaningful practices in research. Okay, the, the, what I was going to do is talk about a story about three minority students. And I'm not, I'm not going to have a, an opportunity to go through all three, but in the five minutes that are left for me, okay, I want to talk briefly about two of them. Okay, the first one was a high school student. Her name was Marina Sugar, um, and uh, she came, it d although it doesn't sound it, she was a minority student, um, and she came from, I would say, a fairly poor background. And uh, the high school teacher came to me and said, you know what? This is a really talented individual. Is there any way that you can get her involved in research in your laboratory? But that was a problem because she was a minor and I was using a lot of radioisotopes. So she couldn't work in my lab per se uh, because they're not allowed to be around radioisotopes. So, you know, one of the nice things about getting tenure is that you can be a real dilettante. Okay? <laughs> it's really hard to get fired unless you really try. So, so once you have tenure, you can sort of like, expand your, your research interests. And one of the things that, you know, always bemused me, you know, right from the earliest lecture, you know, there are certain things that keep you awake at night. You know, there's a question. It's like, God, I don't get this. I, I need to find the answer. And, and this was my question. And I'm sure it's probably very similar <laughs> to the same question that you have thought about. <laughs> I mean, how many people here have wondered how mollusks urinate? <laughs> well, uh, well, all right. Obviously, you're on a different track than I am. <laughs> but ever since my first lecture, this was something that, that really annoyed me. And I actually got into detention because of this. Because we were taught about um, basically urine formation, and we were using the mammalian model. And it's all based upon high blood pressure, forcing basically your blood through a membrane in your kidneys. So that was the process of urine formation. And as, as, as was being explained to me, I was thinking, well, what happens if you have an open blood system? So you have no pressure. I mean, how do you form urine? And the example is mollusks. I mean, they basically have a heart, but they don't have a defined blood system. It's a coelom. It's the blood just flows around. And I was obviously looking bemused, and uh, the, the teacher, Mason, you're having problems with this? You know, what don't you understand? And so I was like, well, how do mollusks urinate? Get in detention. So, <laughs> so it, it became a little bit of a personal crusade. And, and the only thing that really made sense was that, you know, perhaps mollusks urinate through their heart. I mean, it seemed, I mean, is the only logical explanation. So if that was the case, then you should be able to find ultrastructural evidence for it. You should be able to find functionally analogous systems to the human glomerulus and the podocytes that are involved in your filtra filtration. 
So that was the hypothesis that this high school student was involved in. And sure enough, we found them. Here you go. So here is the, the basal lamina, and here is the series of pores, and it basically forms the pro-urine pro through the heart. So wrote this up, and uh, it was a nice little project. Okay, it was a peripheral project, but it solved something that had been nagging me for a while. This student was exceptional, so she was 17 years old, uh, but her parents really couldn't afford her to send her to college. Okay, and, and, and that seemed like a travesty. And, you know, I did one of the things you should never do. You should never go to your student's parents' house and have a discussion with their parents. I mean, that's something you're not meant to do. But, but in this particular instance, because she was a minor and because I felt very heavily invested in this student, you know, I, I did do that. And I talked to them and they said, well, we just can't afford it. And she was one of three sisters. So we, in fact, took her project and entered it into the LA Science School Fair and the State Fair, and she won a National Science Scholars Program fellowship for a free ride to university for her entire undergraduate period. And I was a H1 visa holder, so I didn't have a green card, and I got a letter, and it's from the White House, and the first thing I thought is, these are deportation papers. Because <laughs> that's what you think about when you're an H-1 visa holder, let me tell you. I mean, there's nothing else that matters. Tenure, nothing. You know. uh, but basically, it was commending her on her research. And this was the letter. It was the Department of Education. And it enabled her to, unfortunately, she didn't come to um, Long Beach, Cal State Long Beach. She went to a lesser institution. She went to UCLA. Uh, which, which was a bit of a disappointment. But, I mean, we stayed in contact, and I went to her wedding. And uh, she was about to graduate, and I said, well, what are you going to do for your PhD? That was a huge assumption on my part. I mean, one of the things that we do as academics is we want to breed little caricatures of ourselves, don't we? You know, and, and it never occurred to me that she would want to do anything different. I mean, she was highly successful, brilliant in many, many ways, and it just seemed as though that was the natural trajectory for her. And she said, no, I'm not going to do that. I am actually um, going to teach. And I said, what do you mean you're going to teach? She goes, I'm going to teach in a high school. And I said, you're wasting <coughs> your career. And she responded and she said, you know what? I want to make a difference. And that was an incredibly humbling experience. Because she invited me back a couple of, I think a year or so later, to her house. And she was teaching in the roughest school, in the roughest area of LA. I mean, I was actually scared when I went to her house. She wanted to make a difference. And that's what you do. You take the best teachers and you put them in the worst schools. So it was really nice because I had an opportunity to stay in contact with her. And one of the things that I promised, I said, as I got over my own arrogance, I think, was to understand what she was trying to do. And I said, when you teach, if you ever teach cell biology, I want your students to come to Cal State Long Beach. Okay? And I want to show them the electron microscope by which you got a letter from the White House which enabled you to become a teacher in their school. And you know, we communicated, and here it's a letter it's from Lenox High School. And she would bring her class over. And you know, you can teach them at a really early age. And here, you know, she was using scanning electron microscopy to teach a class. That they caught some bugs. These are really evocative images that students can understand. And you can capture imaginations, even at an early age. And it's really, really important, because we relinquish our responsibility with regards to education of our children and of our students here in the US at a very early age, when you compare it with other countries. We need to make an investment, not just in the CSU, but actually in, in some of the K through 12. 
So here was an example where research gave rise to an opportunity for this student to go to college so that she could go back and make a difference in the substrate of students that we get in the CSU. That's pretty profound. That is the gong, but I just want to talk about <laughs> one other student, all right, all right. Because, and I'm not going to talk about this one, this was a really cool project that we did. We actually did work where, anyway. So, a little bit about the Human Genome Project. This is probably the most profound thing that, that humans have ever done. I mean, we analyzed our own genome and the DNA, and we can read our own codes. It, it talks about our past, it talks about our future, it talks about our ailments. The Human Genome Project is a, just an amazing, amazing scientific discovery. I can't, I can't think of anything more profound. So one of the really bizarre things that came from it was that there were a number of things that we were expecting from the human genome, but there was a bunch of stuff that came as a bit of a surprise. And one of them was the fact that we found certain signatures in the DNA which basically said that we had proteins and a, and a significant number of proteins in our genome that coded for zinc binding proteins. And in fact, about 10% of your genome is involved in binding proteins that have these what we call zinc binding motifs. And about 30% of your entire genome is regulated by zinc. And up to that point in time, we had no idea of the importance of zinc in intermediate metabolism and really as a modulator of gene expression. And, and this particular diagram here, this is, this is a, an enzyme called RNA polymerase, and it reads your DNA. DNA is just a molecule of hereditary. It's just an information base. But to access the information, it has to be read. This is the molecule that does it. And right here, as the DNA unwinds, this is the catalytic center, and right in the heart of that is zinc. So that tells you that evolutionarily, we have evolved with zinc as being a principal component with regards to our ability to access our own information base. That's pretty profound. So the question was, how do we start to look at zinc? We know it's important now, but how is it regulated? And at that point in time, maybe about 30 or 40 years ago, this molecule was discovered. It's called metallothionine. Each and every one of you has it. All right? You have at least seven different isoforms. It's found in your brain, but primarily in your kidneys and livers. And it was an unusual protein because it bound seven atoms of zinc. And these are the atoms here. And it had no enzyme activity. And we had no idea what it did. It had no structural role. So it was, it was a molecule looking for a function. And we couldn't figure it out. And then what happened was this student came to me, probably one of the most brilliant people I have worked with, came to me as an undergraduate. His name is Richard Moraz. And he says, Dr. Mason, he says, you need to read a paper in the proceeding of the natural a National Academy of Sciences that was published this week. This is an undergraduate telling me to read a paper <laughs> in my own discipline because it has some significance to what I should be doing. All right, so, so I got the paper, I read it, and it was like, oh my God, this is really, really important. So what it was, it was a paper by this guy here, Edmund Fisher. He's a Nobel laureate. And what he did was he theorized that we've been looking at the wrong thing and that we've been concentrating on the metal and what we should have been concentrating on was the domains of the protein. And what he said was, this is what I think is happening. But it, it was more of a, I would say, a theorem based upon indirect evidence. And what my student understood was that we had been developing techniques in my laboratory that would actually test his hypothesis directly. And he put all of that together. So I read this, instantly recognized what my student had been sort of indicating to me, and I realized I needed a tame electrochemist to write an NSF grant, which I did, and we got $1.3 million to study this thing. And guess what? He was right. 
the Nobel laureate was right. Okay, we could prove this theorem experimentally in the laboratory, and we published on it. So, so this is actually Edmund Fisher in my laboratory, and this is the paper <laughs> that my student had said, Dr. Mason, you should really read this, okay. So it was an exceptional study that we did, and these are the students that were involved in this, and a whole range of students, and look where they ended up. In fact, I've had over 200 students in my laboratory. Let me tell you, every single one has graduated. I would say 50% were much brighter than myself, and I would say 75% have earned more than I will ever earn <laughs> in my past career. So all of these students did incredibly well. So MD, MD, PhD, Hopkins, MD. And the tame electrochemist was actually at Cal State LA. His name was Faming Zhu, and he had these students here, and they all ended up in PhD program. The one student I'm just going to mention very, very briefly is Alex. So Faming came to me, because I was the PI, and said, you know, this student's got some promise. But Alex has been on probation six times. That has to be a CSU record. He goes, I'd like you to have an interview with this student, see if you want to bring him onto the project. So I had an interview with Alex, and he seemed really bright. And I said, you know, Alex, what about your academic record? And I said, did you fail French? You know, <laughs> no, I, no, actually, I didn't say that. But, but he said, you know what? I, I've had some problems. I've had some problems domestically, and I'm only just getting back into it. And that's all he really said. He was right at a 2.0 GPA. I said, Alex, we'll take a chance on you. Let's see how you do. So this is Alex. And can you see where he's at? He's at the White House. And uh, he won a PCASE award. It's the highest honor bestowed by the feds on science and engineering professionals in the early stage of their independent research careers. That's pretty astounding. It's all a matter of opportunity. And you know what? I never really figured out why he had those problems with his grades. And it was only a couple of years ago that I found out. And apparently, you know, everyone here is laughing. And here's uh, President Obama shake. And, and you got a million dollars, by the way, uh, check um, to invest in research. I asked if I could have a cut, but Alex said no. <laughs> um, but they're all laughing because he said, you're doing some great science. And he was pre-tenure. He said, make sure my department chair knows that. <laughs> and, and that's why apparently everyone's laughing. Um, but I never really found out what the problems were earlier. And then this is what I found out. And this was actually in the newspaper. He never told me. His father was killed, shot six times in the head. And he had real problems. He became head of household, okay, flipped burgers, worked in telecommunications, apparently also spent some time in jail. Phenomenal. And that's why research matters. All right, I ran over, <laughs> I apologize. I think these are compelling stories. All right, our students deserve the opportunity. The CSU should not deny these individuals the opportunity to make their commitment to society. They are all capable. And I would argue, and I, would, I think the chancellor will also argue that we need to be involved. We need to be involved in it. And we do a disservice to all of the students, and particularly our minority students, by not offering them this opportunity. Thank you. All right, questions? Yes. So Richard Moraz, um, he went to Lawrence Berkeley Lab. 
here's another example of how brilliant this kid was. Um, I stay in communication with all of my students. Uh, believe it or not, most of them are professors, eminent MDs. They still call me Dr. Mason. I don't know why. Um, but we were talking over a beer, and he was, he was in a lab where they were looking at genes that coded for non-proteins. And the question was, because I, I won't go into it, but there are, there are RNA molecules that have functions other than the, the ones that are classically described. And I said, you know what? This should be a fairly simple thing to do because what you need to be able to do is you have to look at it and say, okay, is this a st stochastic sequence or are there elements here which show you that you have binding within an RNA, what they call a transcript, that gives rise to three-dimensional structures that have functionality? And then that becomes a statistical issue that you should be able to look at these high probability areas where you have areas where you have annealing of the molecules that come off the DNA. And he went back and he wrote the program, okay, and he worked with his professor there, and I think they discovered about 200, uh, theoretical at this point, RNA genes that had never been discovered. I mean, I had an idea of how to do it, no idea how to implement it, and he wrote the program. He now has his own software company, his own genomic, genomic software company. So he did not go into academia. The most brilliant person I've ever met. He was a student, he was 17. I recognized someone who was intellectually superior to me within about 10 minutes. Yeah. So um, one of the things that uh, came to my mind as I was listening to your presentation is that you started out with the fact that uh, kids of color have lower SAT scores in the CSU. And yet, the kids of color that you had in your lab outperformed many of the white kids and went off and did amazing things. So clearly in your lab, they have a strong sense of community, strong sense of belonging. A lot of the psychosocial uh, mediators that overcome stereotype threat. Yeah. And so um, in your earlier thing, SAT tests can be a proxy for stereotype threat. So you said it was about wealth. Do you think it might be something else as well? that explains their success despite you know, the SAT scores? You know, I, I honestly don't know the SAT scores for all of the students here in my lab. I mean, certainly there, were, there was some self-selection. Um, for whatever reason, they thought I was a pretty intimidating professor. I thought I was really congenial. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the I don't go out and say, okay, you, you, and you are going to be in my research lab. I, I required them to basically, you know, come and have a word with me. I would discuss their career objectives. So I'm, I'm sure that they probably weren't typical of all of the minority students. And I don't know what their SAT scores. One of the things that I can tell you is that, you know, as I raised my expectations for them, you know, and, and I elevated it with their sophistication. There wasn't a challenge that they never met. And I would say that was true in the classroom. You know, these students, <coughs> and I keep bringing it back, they're a lot brighter than I was. I mean, just a lot brighter. And every challenge I gave them, they met it. And then some of them pushed my expectations forward. You know, where I was having to do research to keep up with them. And these are undergraduates. Okay? And, and I think it was, it was more a matter of opportunity. I, I remember one student in particular, um, she was Hispanic, and she failed, she failed her first exam. And I've never given a multiple choice exam, I only give essay questions. And, and, and that poses a problem if you're not English speaking. And I understand that as a non-English non speaker. And she came to see me and says, I need to get an A in this class. And it was introductory biology. And I said, you know, well, you have to earn an A. She said, no, I have to get an A. You don't understand. And I said, well, what don't I understand? And she said, you don't understand because if I don't get an A, my parents are not going to support me going to college. And it goes on to my sister. Right? And that was so out of my understanding 
of what was the driver for these students. You know, it, I just assumed that she just needed an A because she wanted a good grade, because she wanted to go to medical school. No, it was more profound than that. Their family could only afford to send one person to college. And it was a performance-based metric in terms of whether you got the funding or not. <coughs> so I worked with her, okay, and she graduated. She went to Albert Einstein, and she became an MD. And she wrote me a letter many, many years afterwards and said, you know, I never perhaps thanked you for what you did, but you are the only person who has ever believed in me. And I thought that was a really sad statement because I did nothing. I just worked with her a little bit during <laughs> office hours, gave her some additional problems, you know. That's all I did. So I think it's a matter of opportunity, and I think it's a matter of giving time. And you know, I think each of us can recognize there's been a huge investment made in us to get where we were as faculty. You know, <laughs> there are at least three or four mentors who have shaped who and what I am. Okay, and it's a matter of giving back. And one of the things that's always astounded me is that in the research environment, one of the things that I say is that I need to be funded continuously, and that's based upon my publications. And if I don't publish, then all of this disappears. And as a student working in my laboratory, the opportunities that you see now were based upon the productivity of your predecessors. And what I would like you to do is maintain this legacy moving forward so that other students will have the benefit of research. But it depends on your productivity. And you know what? Students have never let me down. 30 years in the CSU, never been let down. I feel very just honored and humbled to have worked in the CSU with all of these students. It's a real privilege. Yeah. Uh, firstly, thank you. Um, you had the word creative. Um, a creative work in, in as part of the title. I just wondered, um, I, I myself am an artist and a scholar, so I wanted to know um, how that p connects to this work. Um, that's generally my yeah. question. You know, I, I don't, I, I call it research, and I preface my talk by saying that I would use that. Um, it, 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 it relates to any type of endeavor that involves scholastic engagement. And look, you know, you'll hear a lot about high impact practices. And you'll hear about research being a high impact practice. I think that does a disservice to research. High impact practices are things that get you through a course and enable you to get a degree. But your research and scholarly activity within the discipline, it changes your mindset for the rest of your life. It did with me. And I would argue it did with all of those other students. It's a lifelong learning lesson in terms of taking the attributes in your knowledge and applying it to new situations. And it could be for research in the sciences, but it could be for enlightenment in the humanities. I mean, collectively, as the academy, it's our responsibility to move civilization forward. You know, whether it's in the technological area or whether it's in defining who we are as humans and the environment that we're going to live in and what we value as individuals. And I think we all have a role to play in that. You know, whether you like it or not, and this is one of the things that always concerned me, was that people thought of me as a mentor. I've never seen myself in that role. Okay, I learn more from my students than they learn from me. I, I guarantee that. And it always disturbed me that I was a mentor. But whether you like it or not, as a faculty member, you're elevated to that position automatically. And with mentorship comes responsibility and accountability. And it doesn't matter what your discipline is. It can be arts and it's what drives you and your discipline and your creativity to advance your field and instilling that in students so they can engage in a meaningful way and they can carry it forward. 
And each and every one of those students is teaching other students. And that's how you move the baseline. I really appreciate your presentation, and also, at least as a role model, in a way that you have men mentored, been, co been a colleague with students, and see that in them. That also takes lots of individual attention, which is paradoxical to, at times, the demands, at least as I hear it in the CSU, where we look at mass numbers. Because in my limited experience here, you know, I have a number of students I work with, but really to be with them, I cannot do 200 students in mentorship. Yeah. Or, and to me, how do you address that? Because I, that's okay. the conflict I see. So I, I agree with you. And, and let's say, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna add that this is also discipline specific. So, you know, the, the first thing is that scholarship has got nothing to do with funding, all right? It's just that funding is available to the sciences because that drives IP, which is fiscally based, all right? So being in the sciences, when I write a grant, I could write for release time, all right? And that gives me an unfair opportunity with regards to my teaching load. The, the only thing that worked, however, because let me tell you, the pressure's not off because I needed round about, I don't know, nearly 200,000 a year to keep my lab moving in the core facility. So I was writing grants constantly. The thing that worked for me was having what I would call corporate knowledge within my laboratory, within my research enterprise. And I had a blend of graduate students and undergraduate students. And, you know, I, th I think there is an excellent sort of way that you can have peer mentorship within your group. And I would delegate authority, for want of a better word, with regards to how things were going to be functioning to a number of my graduate students. I would still have an open door policy. Any of my undergraduates could come and have a word with me. But it was the, the functionality of the entire group in a sort of a synergistic manner that could move the entire research endeavor forward so that it was self-sustaining. The real problem with the CSU is sustaining your research career over the entire period, okay? And you have to be really, really wise. You have to be wise with your sabbaticals, okay? Those were given for a purpose, okay? And what I did was that I used my sabbaticals to write the grants that would ensure funding till my next sabbatical. And when I went into administration, I mean, I had the additional thing of running a lab, teaching. I actually took a, a leave of absence, okay? Financially, I took a hit, but I realized that this was critical because I was gonna fun in, run into a funding gap. I was then gonna be teaching 12 WTU per semester. And at that point, it would have severed my productivity and I would have no longer been competitive. So one of the things that I've always argued that you should be doing as a faculty member is planning out your career in terms of perhaps five-year or six-year segments, okay? And ensuring sustained activity over that period. Sometimes it's dependent upon funding if you're in experimental sciences. Sometimes it's dependent upon the cohort of students that you have in your laboratory. And, and that, I think, is, is really, really important. I think the students learned probably more from between themselves through peer-peer interaction than they did from me. The other observation I'm gonna make is that, you know, when I went out at lunchtime on the Long Beach campus, it was really interesting. We, we call ourselves a diverse, integrated community, but when I looked at the tables, they were sort of segregated again, you know, and you had your Hispanic students here, and your African Americans, and your Caucasians. The only tables that weren't were the research tables. And all the students, they're talking about their research. It's fully integrated, okay? And they learn from each other, cultural values, their backgrounds. So I, I think that has got something to do with it. Peer-peer interaction and starting to understand 
different value sets from the communities that you're in. And they helped each other through organic chemistry and physical chemistry and molecular biology. Okay, and I think that's part of the recipe for success. I'm afraid that's yeah. all the time we have for questions, but um, please join me in thanking Dr. Mason. Thank you.